to do this. Um, I thought uh, what I would do in this period is just uh, uh, try to situate what Marx was doing in volume one of Capital with in relationship to his political economic writings in general. Now Marx had uh, the back of his mind, I think, uh, a notion of the totality. And so I want to talk about uh, the totality uh, that uh, is in the background to the writing of uh, Marx's Capital. And I tried to reconstruct it with a diagram, so if I can have the diagram up. Um, the point about this uh, diagram is that uh, what I tried to do is to talk about the flow of capital. Because Marx's definition of capital is very much about value in motion. And the best way to think about it is to start at the bottom here with money capital. Um, and imagine a capitalist starting with some money and they go off and they buy commodities of two sorts. One, labor power, and the other, means of production. They then take the labor power and the means of production and they put it together in a production process. And the important thing for Marx is that this production process has a double character. It is producing commodities, real things, at the same time as it's also producing and reproducing value and creating surplus value. So that there is an increment in the value from the value of the money to the value which is being created in production. But that increment is then represented within the commodity and the commodity is then taken into the market and sold. And this is what Marx calls the realization of value through the conversion of the commodity into money. And then that money is distributed in various ways. It's distributed in part uh, to wage laborers in, re in, in return for the labor power. Uh, part of it is taken away in taxes, though Marx actually throughout Capital hardly ever mentions taxes, which is a little peculiar. Uh, it's then divided amongst different groups of capitalists between what Marx calls the industrial capitalists, i.e. those doing the direct producing, but some of it is also taken by landlords uh, in the form of rent. Some of it is taken by merchants as capital uh, which uh, they deploy, and some of it is taken by bankers. So there's a, f a moment of distribution, and then that money is then reconverted back into two things. One is some of it supports demand, effective demand, uh, and some of it then flows back into, be, into reinvestment. And this is a cyclical process. But as Marx points out in practice, because the system is growing and expanding, it's not a cycle, it's a spiral. And that the whole thing is spiraling onwards and growing and growing and growing. So it is a growth process, which is occurring through this circulation process. Now, I've colored in red these three distinctive moments in this process. Uh, the first is the production or what Marx called valorization. The second is realization, uh, which occurs in the market. The third is distribution. And the cycle has to go through these different moments. And what Marx does in volume one of Capital is to start to talk about this whole system in the first three chapters. But then he, he says, I'm only going to deal in volume one with production. So, in fact, production simply describes this passage from money through the purchase of commodities, means of production and labor power, the process of production, the creation of commodities, and then takes you up to the point of realization. And then the story stops. And what Marx does is, is to say, 
and I can quote you from volume one of Capital, if you like, but I'm just a bit too long, so I won't do it. Uh, but he basically says, uh, I assume everything else that goes on in this cycle occurs in a normal way. And the normal way means it's unproblematic and untroubled, and that therefore we don't have to enter into any big discussion. So in volume one of Capital, the landlord is not mentioned, rent is not mentioned, bankers hardly have any role at all. So uh, Marx is assuming in volume one uh, that, that what they do is, is entirely neutral in, in relationship uh, to what he's looking at in volume one. Similarly, he also takes this moment of realization and makes an assumption. And the assumption is that all commodities exchange at their value. That is, there's absolutely no problem in the market. So Marx does not consider any difficulties in the market at all in volume one of Capital. And what's interesting here is that actually Marx in his three volumes of Capital, the first volume is about production, the first red thing, and everything that goes on around that. The second volume is about realization and what goes on in the market. And the third volume is about distribution. Now, one of the arguments I make is that actually you really can't understand what Marx is doing in capital unless you understand the totality of these relations between production, realization, and distribution. If you read only volume one of capital, then you're going to miss out on a lot of things which are extremely important. Now, here we have a problem. Because volume one of Capital is a magnificent piece of literature. I and mean, when you get used to it, it's fun to read. It's actually brilliantly constructed. And, you know, it's seductive as hell. It's an amazing piece of, 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 of writing. And, 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 you know, I've taught it for many times and it's always a beautiful thing to teach. Volume two is incredibly boring. It's not very interesting. It's not a good piece of literature at all. In fact, it's a disaster. But it was mainly constructed by Engels out of uh, Marx's notes. So a lot of people don't actually get on with volume two and say, well, I read it once, but I'm not going to read it again because I'm not, it's not worth it. And volume three is a chaotic mess, brilliant in passages and, you know, but on the other hand, what we have to do is to recognize that what Marx does in volume one of Capital is only part of the story. But if you read the first three chapters of volume one, you find he actually has some aspects of the story uh, uh, sort of sketched in. For example, the end of the very first section of Capital, Marx says, you know, uh, if when you get to the market, there is no want, need, or desire for a commodity, and nobody has any money to pay for it, then there's no value. So he's interested in the circulation of value and the preservation of value and the expansion of value, but that expansion depends upon there always being a want, need, and desire for commodities. And if there is not one, then you have to make one. And one of the interesting features of the whole history of capitalism is, of course, the creation of new wants, needs, and desires. And this is no easy process. In fact, it has a long and difficult history. And many aspects of class struggle are over trying to force desires on people, which to have things they don't want, and not to give them things they do want. So that actually the whole question of realization is problematic. And Marx says, in Grundrisse, he says, you know, capital is really about what he calls a contradictory unity between production and realization. And if you only examine production, then, and you forget realization, then you, out, you know, you've eliminated one of the crucial contradictions which exist in a capitalist society. But, again, in volume one of Capital, in the third chapter, he says, you know, commodities, he says, are in love with money, but the course of true love never did run smooth, and then he talks about you know, all the ways in which actually when you get into the marketplace all kinds of bad things can happen and, and capitalists will actually lose all of their value and you'll get devaluation coming into the picture. 
And that there then turns out to be a very interesting relationship under the table, as it were, was in the first part of capital, which is a relationship between value and not value. <coughs> value and anti-value, which is the anti-value arises when there is no market for the commodity. And when there's no market for the commodity, then there's devaluation, loss of value. So, in the first few chapters then, he actually uh, you know, gets into the question of the creation of new wants, needs and desires, talks about that, and then kind of says, but I'm forget going to forget that, but I'm going to assume everything exchanges at its value. Now, there are many assumptions Marx uses in constructing Volume 1. Similarly, when he gets into Volume 2, he says, I assume there's no technological change. Well, Volume 1 is all about technological change. So in Volume 2, he assumes away everything that he's done in Volume 1 and says, OK, I'm now going to look at the system from the standpoint of circulation of value and the standpoint of the market. But in order to do that, I have to get out of technological change out of the picture. And, and, so, uh, and the same thing tends to happen in Volume 3 of Capital. At that point, Marx kind of says, well, I assume in Volume 3 of Capital that there, the technological change has only a very, very specific form. And I assume, he says, that circulation and production of value is occurring in its, quote, normal way. So, he, in, in effect, he assumes everything that is okay in Volume 1 in order to examine the material of Volume 3. Now, there's nothing wrong, it seems to me, with an analyst doing this kind of thing. The, the, the problem arises when people read him and forget the assumptions. Let me give you one very crucial example. At the end of Volume 1, he kind of says, you know, the capitalists are looking for surplus value. Surplus value comes from exploiting labor by taking as much labor as you possibly can and acquiring it, which means that you try to reduce the wage rate as much as you can of the, of, the, of the workers so that you get more and more profit and the tendency of capital is to reduce wages, reduce the standards of living of the working class, to create unemployment and there is this wonderful chapter there where he talks about the creation of an industrial reserve army and the increasing impoverishment of the working classes over time and the increasing uh, concentration of wealth uh, within the affluent classes. The rich get rich at one pole, the poor get poorer at the other pole. And he shows that logically this is what a capitalist society must do under the assumptions he's laid out in Volume 1. Now, when teaching this, people then look at you and say, well, that didn't really happen, did it? I mean, if it was supposed to happen this way in 1857, you know, then why, you know, why, why is it not, uh, why, why do we have affluent working classes now, living in the suburbs with, with two cars in the driveway and a television set and all those kinds of things? This is, not, this is not what a lot of the working classes are living like in advanced capitalist countries. So there's a certain kind of skepticism that then comes in, in terms of, well, you know, Marx has really got it all wrong. Except when you sort of go and look at, you know, worker suicides in Foxconn in, in China, and you look at some of the things that are going on in Bangladesh, and factories burning down, and all those kinds of things, you can say, well, actually, I can put that all into the chapter on the working day in Volume 1 of Capital, and there's an, an essential truth to it. So what's the truth here? Well, when you read Volume 2, what you find out is that if you reduce the standard of living of the working class, you're actually destroying the market. And what Volume 2 suggests is that the capitalists have to maintain a certain standard of living for the working class if they're going to maintain the equilibrium between demand and supply in the market. He didn't have to consider that in Volume 1 because he's considered all of those questions out of the way because everything exchanges it at its value in Volume 1. But in Volume 2 what he shows is that and as the system expands, you may need to expand the actual consumerism of the working classes. You need, he says at the end of Volume 2, rational consumption. And if the capitalists do what they do in Volume 1, then you're going to create a crisis. <laughs> 
So, volume two tells you a completely different story. And the completely different story is because Marx is there working under different assumptions. And this, I think, however, is a very interesting dichotomy when you kind of say, let's go back to that phrase that it's production and realization and the dialectical contradiction between them which is significant, then you'd say, there's a contradiction between volume one and volume two. And at this point, students say, well, you see, Marx is stupid. He's got a, you know, he's, he's, he's saying exactly opposite things. And you say, no, he's pointing out to you a foundational contradiction that exists within any capitalist system. In the 1960s, for example, the economy was being structured along volume two lines. That is, people were looking for rational consumption. How do we promote rational consumption? Suburbanization, the automobile, you know, two cars in the driveway, you know, get the working class, give them more money, and all this kind of stuff. So volume, volume two economy was very much uh, the sort of thing that was going on in the 1960s and 1970s. And the problem, of course, is this was empowering the working class and they got too strong and capital got fed up with it and said we've got to have a counter-revolution so let's go after the neoliberal kind of story which is volume one. And actually I experienced this wonderfully because when I first taught, was teaching capital it was in the middle of the volume two world. And it was hard to make sense of volume one with all of the things going on around. By the time you get to 1990 it wasn't hard at all to teach volume one. You could just simply tell people to go read that you know, article in the New York Times about conditions of labor in Indonesian factories. And, 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 and then everybody said, well, yeah, no, wow. Then you see, but there's, there's this contradictory unity between volume one and volume two, and we were in a volume one uh, world, have been in a volume one world recently, and guess what? What Marx said about that volume one world is the rich are gonna get richer and the poor are gonna get poorer you're going to get greater and greater inequalities of income. And what's happened since 1970? Greater and greater inequalities of income. And what Marx shows in volume one quite brilliantly is that if you insist that the market is king and you go to a market-based society, then actually the more you come closer to perfection of the market, the greater the level of inequality, which of course is against Adam Smith's utopia. Adam Smith's utopia was, okay, let the market do its work and everybody will be better off. And Marx says, oh yeah, let the market do its work and the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. And I will show you exactly how it happens. Which is why volume one is such a brilliant piece of argument because it does show you exactly how that will happen under the assumption that everything exchanges at its value and there is no problem in the, in the world of distribution. So this is the sort of thing that comes out from the volume one analysis, which is what I would call a contingent generalization. And I think it's important to take all of the statements in volume one and say, under these assumptions, this is what will happen. When you drop the assumptions, then you're gonna get a different story. And which story is prevailing right now? Well, and like I've said, it seems to me that we're in this volume, we're back in the volume one world, and in that sense, Capital, volume one, is a far more dramatically, directly uh, applicable analysis to what's going on in the world right now uh, than, uh, than, uh, than volume two. But it was not that way back in 1970. It was not that way at all when I first started teaching it. And I think this is kind of one of the lessons that I've got out of teaching it all, all of that all that time. But this then brings us also to the question of about volume three. Uh, actually, it turns out volume three is far, far more important than most people have recognized and understood. And not simply because of the foreign rate of profit argument that Marx makes at the outset. It's much more important because Marx starts to talk about the roles of particularly finance capital and the capacity to create fictitious capital. And actually, in volume three of Capital, you start to see that the driving force of this system here is just as much located in the moment of distribution as it is located down here by individual capitalists. And it's located there in a number of different ways. And I don't have time uh, to go into it. I just sort of published a book about it, but you know, so you can go read it there. But 
the point is that, that actually there is a tremendous pressure coming from the distributive sphere to expand and push this system further and further and further. And it does it by debt. That the creation of debt in this sphere of distribution is what I call creation of a form of anti-value which has to be redeemed by value production. Give you an example. Pension funds. I have a pension fund. I contributed to it. The pension fund has a fiduciary duty to launch the money I've put in it out into this system and to come back with as much profit as it possibly can. Now it's not only pension funds, it's endowments of everything, you know. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of latent power which is driving this system which exists in the distributive moment. And it's no longer necessarily the greedy capitalists who want to get surplus value, which starting at the bottom here is one source of this. It's no longer necessarily the greedy capitalists who are pushing this system to grow and grow and grow, even in the face of obvious limitations. It's not, it's not necessarily that at all. It's the growth of fictitious capital. The growth of a new capital which is searching for some sort of redemption of a debt. Now, this creates all sorts of interesting dilemmas in our society right now. That actually, when you start to look at the role of debt and how Marx handles it, it becomes more and more the central nervous system of how this whole system is working. And he starts to come to that in the volume three of Capital in rather confused chapters about, uh, about how banking works and all the rest of it. But he clearly sees that the creation of debt is also a way of foreclosing on future value production. Because debt is a claim upon future value production. It's a claim upon the future. And in fact, the more debt we create, the more we have actually foreclosed upon the future because our future is to redeem the debt we've incurred right now. Now, I know this is going to sound to you a little bit like the right-wing waivers about, you know, get rid of the debt and all that kind of thing, but there's a certain truth to what they're saying. And that truth lies in, lies in the fact that actually the way in which the system is perpetuating itself so clearly right now, is through this mechanism of creating debt and then creating a situation where we have to work to redeem that debt. This is what student debt is all about. This is what encouragement uh, in the 1930s onwards of home ownership and mortgage debt was about. The saying back in the 1930s was, debt encumbered homeowners don't go on strike. So it's a way of sealing in the system, the way in which our future is foreclosed. And Marx, in talking about fictitious capital, and talking about these things, is talking about a future that is foreclosed. And it is foreclosed by the debt. And that is the way in which the system has been actually stabilizing itself by creating more and more debt. For example, when we look at, when I said that, you know, in the 1960s we had a different kind of an economy, it was a volume two economy. We've now gone into a volume one economy, but then the question arises, well, if workers are getting less and less than the share of national income, and all the data show that that's what's happening in all of the advanced capitalist countries and, and beyond, if that is the case, then where is the market? How is the market being sustained? The answer has been, get out the credit cards. Pass the credit cards to everybody. So actually, when you start to look at the data on personal debt, corporate debt, and state debt, you find it has been accelerating. And accelerating at an astonishing rate. And this, for Marx, is about the way in which capital is foreclosing its future. As it does so, of course, it's also foreclosing things by many of the processes which are talked about in Volume 1. 
But you have to put those processes, as Marx analyzes them in volume one, in connection with this overall dynamic of this system as it's working. And there are two things I would want to say about this. First, when you look at the overall dynamic, you then ask yourself the question, what is going to happen when artificial intelligence, for example, starts driving more and more people out of work? We've already seen how that's happened in manufacturing. Automation of manufacturing has reduced manufacturing jobs dramatically. When I went to live in Baltimore in 1969, there was a steel works and it was employing something like 37,000 people. By the time you get to 1990, it's producing the same amount of steel, but it's, it's only got 5,000 people. And now it's entirely gone. Well, this is a familiar story. And actually, technological change has, of course, reduced very much the working class of that sort and replaced it with precarious labor and all those other things we know about. When that happens, then the question arises, well, the next wave of it is going to uh, deal not with manufacturing, but with services. It is the case, you know, when you go to the airport, you check yourself in. When you go to the supermarket, you check yourself out. We're doing a lot of the labor now. Actually, consumers, we're becoming what Tal Toffler long ago called prosumers. Uh, we actually work uh, at, at, at our, at, in, in our consumption processes. So this is, this is one of the things that then is there. And it's interesting. Some people kind of say, well, the only answer to this is we've got to have a, a, a sort of universal guaranteed basic income. And guess who's in favor of that? Well, okay, so there are some leftists, the autonomistas and the rest of it, but actually Silicon Valley likes it. I mean, their vision of the future is you get a basic income, so you subscribe to Netflix and die watching, you know, Game of Thrones or something like that. <laughs> I, mean, this is the, this is, I mean, but this is the future that starts to be foreclosed. And it, of course, it's all laid out as uh, a utopia, but every innovation that's come along in the past, and this is a great line that comes from volume one of Capital, where Marx kind of says, John Stuart Mill seems to be confused when he says he cannot understand how it is that technological innovations which should lighten the load of labor actually make the conditions of, of laboring worse. And Marx says, well, of course it does. Because the capitalists are not interested in lightening the load of labor, they're interested in extracting the maximum of surplus value. And poor John Stuart Mill hasn't got a theory of surplus value, so he can't understand that. Every innovation that comes down the pike is a socialist dream that turns into a capitalist nightmare. So that's, again, one of the things that I think that comes out of volume one of, of Capital. The last point I want to make is you'll notice that the, all these elements which are around, surround this. And actually, these are referred to in volume one of Capital. For instance, take the relation to nature. The metabolic relation to nature crops up several times in capital, but Marx says, I'm not going to deal with it here, but it's obviously crucially important. And there's a lot of struggle going on, of course, around the production, destruction, sustaining of the natural world in which we live. And Marx argues that throughout capital, that capital relies very much upon what he calls the free gifts of nature. Similarly, it also, when you go to the top, it relies heavily upon the free gifts of human nature, the few free gifts of history of culture. He talks about the productivity of the worker and the intelligence of the worker, which has taken eons to, to, to build. And then this is also a free gift, the free gift that comes in social reproduction. These things are all sort of significant to the way in which capital works, but Marx says, I'm not going to talk about these in volume one of capital. These are contextual conditions which are foundational and fundamental, and we should understand them that way, but I'm not going to write about them. Again, read volume one very carefully, and don't, don't put too much emphasis upon all of its conclusions, because its conclusions are contingent, and there are many things that are left out. But when you understand what is left out, and when you understand what the assumptions are, you can have a brilliant read of a brilliant thesis which explains why it is that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer the closer you get 
to a pure market economy. And how that pure market economy actually ends up being sealed in, foreclosed upon by debt regimes, and that's, however, all coming out of, 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 of volume three. So there's a wealth of things to be learned from, from this text right now. And a wealth of things which are right prevalent in, in, in the here and now. And it, and it drives me crazy when some of these people write about Marx as if he's some old-fashioned 19th century gentleman who is writing about 19th century society and it's all passé. But capital is still alive and well. He was a great critic of capital. And to the degree that he was a critic of, has a critique of capital, it's, it's even more relevant now than it was when he was writing. Because when he was writing, capital is hegemonic only in one very little, small corner of the world. It's now everywhere. It dominates even in China and places of that sort. And, and you're looking at a situation in which it's far, far more relevant now to read capital than it was back in Marx's day. Because there is no outside of capital. There's nowhere left to go. It's cannibalizing itself in many ways through the production of anti-value as a means to create and absolutely assure the further co construction and production of value for a capitalist class which is getting huger and huger and more affluent by the bit. One final point. Many people say to me, oh, concept of class is very confused and how do you define the working class, all this kind of thing. Yeah, it is difficult. But the one thing I have no difficulty whatsoever doing is defining the capitalist class. I know who the bastards are and we're going to get them. <laughs> okay? And it's pretty obvious who they are. It's just guys like Mnuchin and all of that, you know. So let us actually, when we're doing a class analysis, maybe start to think about a movement that is an anti-capitalist movement which is against that class. And it's a very complex movement because it's all over this map. It's partly in relation to nature, it's about the destruction of cultures, it's about the production of wants, needs and desires, it's about all of those elements. There's a whole map of a terrain of different struggles going on uh, within this totality. And, but it struggles against capital and against this laws of motion which capital is about. So let me leave it there. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, to the Goethe Institute, uh, to Karl Marx for writing Capital 150 years ago, and to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, and also uh, to David Harvey for that great presentation. Um, there was a very, very uh, rational and efficient division of labor uh, in our tasks. Uh, I, I do not have the difficult task of laying out the entirety of Marx's system for you. Instead, what I'm going to talk about tonight is I've sort of clustered it around uh, teaching capital. Uh, which is a little bit daunting as uh, David is easily the world's best known and one of the best uh, received teachers on, uh, on capital, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, and I'm also very much looking forward to Nancy Holmstrom's uh, presentation as she's speaking on many things very, very near and dear to my heart, both Marxist feminism, ecology, all kinds of things that I am looking forward to hearing to. But what I want to think about as we approach capital and its contemporary relevance is how capital is still a brilliant pedagogical tool to this day, particularly if we approach it, and Marx's work, overall work, with the kind of undogmatic theoretical openness and ruthlessness that Marx himself demonstrated, leaving few idols, at least the ones he noticed, unsmashed and willing to the end of his days to see some of his most crucial concepts challenged, as he did. In, for example, his late-life correspondence with Russian interlocutors like uh, Vera Zasilich and others, when he explicitly explored the possibility that his neat stage system that he laid down in the Communist Manifesto might, in fact, be able to be skipped, jumped, sidestepped, or otherwise adjusted depending on different geographic circumstances. Um, this actually came to fruition in some ways. Uh, it's also the hundredth year of the uh, hundredth anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, and you know, as soon as they knew that the World Revolution was not nipping at their heels, they knew they were off the Marxist map in some ways, and some, and off the map of capital. That's not a criticism of capital. That shows the way in which it is a, it is a sy systematic analysis that gives way to different kinds of practical political action in different terrains and different circumstances. So, 
to move backwards. The initial political and intellectual intervention of Marx was both in the context of sort of competing socialisms and socialists at the time. Um, Marx called these various different names. I'll look at the bourgeois and the utopian. And also, of course, liberal thinkers. There were like some monarchists hanging around, but we don't have to worry about them. Um, the utopian socialists. Think about people like Charles Foyer, right, with his wild, improbable glass uh, phalansteries, these kind of hyper-modernist, hedonistic, in the best possible way, monasteries. Marx thought of this stuff as basically a bit silly. But, but he didn't dismiss it out of hand. He, uh, he thought at least it threw light uh, in the classic tradition of utopian writing on areas for better explication, on the places that we're not looking. Marx thought considerably less of the more moralistic socialists. Although, although Marx's language, uh, even in Capital, drips with a clear moral judgment, his critique of Capital is not that it is evil or bad. Um, that was the moralistic form of criticism more popular with earlier socialists of Marx's day. A politics, for example, and a figure like LaSalle, um, which takes on the character of a modern kind of noblesse oblige. There have been countless debates about the place of this kind of moral, of, of, of a kind of morality or meta-ethics in Marx, and I have no wish to recapitulate or enter that fray here. Um, a moralistic presentation might be effective for communication or might be effective for organization, um, although I think we should always take into account that it can walk hand in hand with a kind of romantic anti-capitalism that can be reactionary just as easily as revolutionary. But it is fundamental in teaching Marx and thinking about capital as a pedagogical tool that we understand how Marx did not see his critique as moral. It is not about evil capitalists, nor is it about gluttonous consumers, although I think uh, David is right and we can identify the capitalists class quite easily. Um, it's not about, uh, a, 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 you know, from the very first page of Capital, which I often encourage students to dwell on at length, we know that Marx isn't out to judge us. I mean, I'm not going to read from it. I actually bought the book with me. But you know, he has this wonderful definition of the commodity. You know, it's, uh, it uh, fulfills a desire, a, a want of the stomach, or a desire of the, of the mind. Right? Um, he's not there to police us. He's not there with hair shirts. He's not there to make you feel bad. He's there to make you understand. The capital is there to make you understand the logic of an internally contradictory system. Theories of crisis and, and historical and determinism aside, I would offer one thesis perhaps here, that Marx, uh, and perhaps more importantly us, we, as contemporary historical materialists, should understand this logic as approximate, maybe even probabilistic, and Marx's dialectics as what I like to call approximate dialectics. Too often, Marxian analysis can get tangled in looking for dialectical perfection, as if it's a perfect system of logic in a frictioned material world. And I wonder if in the spirit of Marx and iconoclasm here on the 150th anniversary, we might imagine a Marxism more Humean than Hegelian, um, more willing to engage with this kind of messy material universe um, that is necessary for today. In the background of the universe of capital lies, uh, as discussed, Adam Smith's butcher, brewer, baker, and their lack of benevolence, and also their mutual reliance. Um, Marx presents capital as a critique of political economy, you know, laying bare what it, uh, its assumptions, laying bare its inner workings, but he's also drawing on it. He's also drawing on a sort of classical philosophical basis in sort of Aristotle, right? Th this is thinking about uh, like, uh, an aerodynamic version of the world, right? Necessarily universal if socially articulated inputs are needed for all people universally. Uh, health, friendship, wealth, leisure. Indeed, a world of Republican virtue, and dare I even say liberalism, lies behind capital. I am with Engels in thinking that capital rests easily and well with the science of Darwin and the metaphysics of Spinoza. Thus, that there is an ethic here, but not a morality per se. Not a good in itself, but rather a system of analysis that produces a politics based in realizing a concrete situation of material social abundance and, indeed, simultaneously individual pleasure. Needless to say, this was not how many late 19th century Marxists received Marx. Um, this sort of story that gets told about the, uh, everyone was an economic determinist, this can be overblown, but it was a popular interpretation by the end of the 19th century. Whereas in Marx himself, we can see political action take place, not just in his overly political writings, and the letters, and the histories, but within capital itself. 
Again, in teaching capital, we encounter, for example, quite famously, the struggle over the length of the working day, a non-reformist reform, if ever there was one, as the fight over time, if you take the theory of surplus value seriously, uh, is a fight over power in the system itself. And there can be a way of treating capital as a sort of total system, a complete and, and finished. And I think that this misses some of the power of, of, and of why ca Marx and capital has been so enduring. It's the openness of the system and its ability to explain and produce a politics of human emancipation across so many different terrains that has made it so important and so vital to systems of analyses and social movements long after you know, Marx's death. Um, so, for example, you know, think of this not only in terms of, you know, I mentioned the Soviets, but not only in terms of the Soviets or Western Marxists, but also in terms of, um, of colonial liberation, uh, of, of national self-determination movements. Here in the United States, think of uh, like the CIO organizing uh, multiracial uh, unions in the South, or the CPUSA demanding uh, national self-determination um, uh, movements in South Asia, China, and so on and so forth. I mean, all of these systems, so I, I, I have to say to students, they breathe the air of capital. Um, I actually bought my Marx syllabus with me tonight. And one of the things, you know, I'll actually skip right to the, the bit about Fanon, right? Because um, I'm coming out thinking about this sort of colonial situation and things like this. Um, you know, someone like Fanon, right, writing in the period of decolonization, thinking about ideas that Marx, you know, that post-date Marx, right? He's thinking about, he's drawing from psychological literature, he's drawing from his own, in fact, a, a psychiatric practice and his own experiences in the decolonization movement, thinking about racial dynamics, dynamics of colonial recognition. Um, but he doesn't say he's overturning Marx. He says, I'm stretching Marx. He says, I am making room in the system or ha allowing this system to sort of have room to understand these other forms of domination that are vital to keep this machine running. Um, so the, the key thing that I like to impart on students, and we read a lot of capital, is that in every one of these spaces, these sort of empty holes that uh, David was talking about, right, these incomplete parts of volumes two and three especially, um, but even in volume one, right, we get an, an idea of primitive accumulation, right, but it's not until Rosa Luxemburg comes along that we understand the, that this that colonialism is internal to the already global capital system, right? That this is where overproduced goods are going to be dumped, and this is where, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, raw materials are going to be extracted. You know, we, in Marx, a coat is a coat is a coat. In our world, it's a Marc Jacobs or a, or a, a, a you know, some other designer. I'm not so good at this game. Um, but, you know, if you look in Capital Volume 1, just from the little section, very famous, right, the critique of the, of the commodity fetish, right, the critique of the way in which commodities stand and seem to have a life of their own and obscure the view of, of labor and, and the view of the production process behind it, the entire work of a theorist like Walter Benjamin is really extracted out of that one little kernel and understanding a world of consumerism that took sh uh, shape over the course of the late 19th century and of course over the last century and one in which we live in to this day. Um, I also think that contemporary non-Marxist work, so I think of someone like uh, Thomas Piketty, right, uh, is very important to study and think with along with capital. I think he actually protests too much in not being in, in, in not claiming any Marxist heritage, but his methods, his methods are macroeconomic, economic history. But when we look at his work, we have an empirical account of at least part of this story, an empirical account that shows us that the tendency over time of the rate of return on uh, to capital is always going to exceed the rate of return on growth, i.e. wages. Um, there's so many other examples I could go through here, right? Gramsci, understanding that Marxism produces a, a politics, but that that politics has its own logic that he stretches back to Machiavelli and others to understand. Um, Shulmuth Firestone, arguing that how can we possibly understand the reproduction of commodities? 
um, without understanding social reproduction and the reproduction of humans themselves in the first place. You know, there, there's this sort of vast array of thinkers and movements that capital opens up onto. And finally, and I think most importantly, recent work on the Anthropocene draws on those passages that David mentioned on metabolic rift in volume three. You know, and I always think, it, you, you mentioned them as sort of unfinished notes. I always think of them as like that scene in Monty Python where, you know, the castle of Arg where the guy dies while he's writing and he's like, ah, oh, I'm good. It, we're in the castle of Ugh. And Marx has a very similar thing with metabolic rift, where he's like, did you notice that these compounds, they move from the fields into the ocean? And it's, and it's up to us, really, to pick up this part of the story, which is so vital for understanding that, this, that the social is embedded and indeed not separate at all from the ecological and extrapolate it. And it has been so important for contemporary um, social thinkers who work on uh, the ecological horizon. Um, so just to sum up, what I always tell my students at the end of my course on Marx is that with Marx, the sky's the limit in terms of where you might turn to continue your thinking and your practice. Um, Capital is one of these texts, you know, it's, it's, to me, it, like, it's one of the big three. It sits alongside the origin of species or like the case studies of Freud. It endures not as the end point of a conversation. It's not scripture, but it is the perpetual beginning of a new one. And it's one I hope we can continue here tonight. Thank you. I want to thank everyone at Rosa Luxemburg for organizing this and, and for including me. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and um, I just want to say how much I wish that I'd had courses from David Harvey to teach me this. Um, I had been a socialist activist uh, since the end of high school, uh, but I never read much of any Marx, maybe Communist Manifesto, until after graduate school. Uh, where I specialized in analytic philosophy, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and I did my politics completely separate. When I tried to put them together, I pretty much had to do it on my own, and that was not so easy. Uh, I went on to read, write, and teach um, Marxism, uh, I think, I hope, fairly effectively, but I've always felt a little bit uh, combined and uneven and like catching up. So here's uh, my contribution. Um, the idea of a mode of production, excuse me, the idea of a mode of production that Marx develops in Capital, though he talked about it earlier, is the essential methodological tool for understanding history, different societies, and the possibilities for change. According to Marx, exploitation is essential to all class societies, indeed, defining of class societies both in general of an, and in every particular form. While many people think that Marx's concept of exploitation was specific to capitalism as the extraction of surplus value, he makes clear that this is just the specific form that exploitation takes in capital. I'll give you two quotes. Quote, this from volume one. The essential difference between the various economic forms of society between, for instance, a society based on slave labor and one based on wage labor lies only in the mode in which this surplus labor is in each case extracted from the actual producers, the laborer, unquote. Or this from volume three, quote, the specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of direct producers determines the relations of rulers and ruled." Unquote. From these and other quotes, I interpret, I infer that a particular kind of coercion and surplus extraction are connected in all class societies. Indeed, they're constitutive of the relations of production that define a given mode of production. Exploitation occurs when producers lack control of their means of subsistence, and hence, in order to survive, they're forced, directly or indirectly, to work for others who appropriate their labor's product. In slavery and in feudalism, though the, both the force and the surplus are clear. In capitalism, less clear. 
Marx's specific account of how this happens in capitalism rests on the labor theory of value. But his understanding of exploitation in capitalism is broader than this. Workers, he says, quote, agree, i.e. are compelled by social conditions to work for others who reap the product of their labor, unquote. With or without the labor theory of value, this is true. The mode of production analysis helps us to see that exploitation also existed in post-capitalist societies. The fundamental question is always, who controls the means of production? In Soviet-style bureaucratic systems, it was the bureaucracy uh, that controlled the means of production and subsistence, leaving producers no choice but to work for them. And it was the bureaucracy that controlled the surplus for the, their needs and purposes. So this allows us to see the continuity between capitalism, feudalism, slave systems, and the bureaucratic systems. However, the specific differences between them are equally important. Each mode of production, Marx, as Marx understood it, has certain kinds of structures and tendencies, a certain nature, if you will. In capitalism, being a kind of competitive market system, each capitalist firm must try to maximize its own profit in order to beat the other capitalists and get a larger share of the market. So each, for, uh, so each firm is compelled to grow, to expand, to revolutionize the forces of production in order to produce more while lowering their costs. Other systems, both pre- and post-capitalist, do not have this built-in imperative. Indeed, slavery and feudalism were marked by stasis and crises of underproduction, capitalism by crises of overproduction. This concept of mode of production is, imp is important for several debates, starting with what changes are and are not possible within capitalism. Consider gender relations. In developed capitalist countries, women have become more independent from men and more equal, both legally and economically, than ever before. Nevertheless, they still are subject to sexual predation, as Trump has helped to highlight, and they still do the bulk of caring labor, whether for free or low, for low pay. Now, low-paid care work fits the account of exploitation in capital, but the work they do for free does not. Feminists have often criticized Marx on this point, but since capital is intended to elucidate what makes the capitalist system tick, so to speak, unpaid labor is irrelevant. So this criticism is not to the point, in my opinion. Marxist and socialist feminists have, however, developed an enriched account of social reproduction, which tries to supplement the account given in capital, showing the importance of this labor, both in human terms and for capital, capitalism, since it produces labor power. Now, the extraordinary improvements in gender relations within capitalism raise the question of whether women and men could ever be totally equal in a capitalist society. Liberals think so. And some Marxists seem to imply it by their contention that, unlike class oppression, sex and race oppression are not essential to capitalism. But while well, they're not logically essential, that is, we can imagine a gender and race neutral version of capitalism, it doesn't follow that they're incidental. Indeed, as Marxist feminists, including myself, have argued, they're very likely historically or pragmatically necessary. Consider what women have and have not achieved. What they've achieved are their basic democratic rights, which do not threaten profits, indeed, that may augment them. But care work in the US is still largely a private responsibility because supporting care work as the public good, it certainly is, would seriously cut into profits. 
In other countries with more generous social supports, the advent of global neoliberalism has meant drastic cutbacks. The nature of capitalism thus put constraints on gender and race equality. Today, while individual women and minorities have moved to the very top ranks of society, class differences among women and among blacks have actually increased. Any movements that could reduce sex and race oppression must be based on working class struggles, integrating other forms of oppression. Thus, the counterposition of class and so-called identity politics is misleading, indeed counterproductive. Another and probably most important example of capitalist limits to change is the multiple ecological crises facing the planet, which, as Al Gore's ch uh, charts show, took off with the development of capitalism. It's imperative to grow is simply incompatible with a sustainable environment. I'll return to this point in a moment. But I first, I also want to point out that the mode of production analysis helps us to understand debates uh, about countries transitioning to capitalism. Many post-colonialist thinkers have denied that Marxist analyses are applicable to countries like India because, they argue, India lacks key features of developed capitalism, in particular, liberal political and cultural institutions. But Vivek Chibber, using the mode of production analysis, clarifies that Marxism does not contend that capitalist um, development will be uniform all over the world, but rather that certain features of capitalism are universal. Universal, not uniform. Capital's economic needs, the sine qua non being profit maximizations, are the defining ones. They are present in India, and in fact, they might be aided by the very traditional social hierarchies and oppression that post-colonialists deem to be incompatible with capitalism. The previous point regarding capitalism and ecological crisis is underlined by considering the changes in the Soviet Union and China. While both countries developed under Stalin and Mao, their push for development and growth was not the same as capitalism, either in scope, nowhere near the same growth, or in cause. Unless the bureaucracy decided to develop something, it didn't happen. There was no automatic motor that drove growth as a market system does. In fact, the cause of growth was more like feudalism in that it stemmed from political rather than economic needs. As few lords competed with each other, so these countries competed with other global powers. According to Richard Smith, who's here somewhere tonight, uh, China today is a hybrid mode of production. The capitalist sector of the economy has created enormous growth, 20% growth rate. But the other sector of state-owned industries and enterprises, which includes the commanding heights of the economy, run on very different imperatives. Many of the state-owned enterprises are justly called dinosaurs because they would have gone extinct in a fully capitalist economy. But the government cannot afford to let millions of people be unemployed. So they create things like ghost cities. You may have read about that. Um, they're totally irrational from a capitalist point of view, as Western economists never tire of pointing out. Krugman had a column called Beijing's Bunglers. They, these kinds of things make perfect sense in the bureaucratic mode of production. The common, this combination of market-driven growth in the largest economy of the world and the lack of even the minimal political democratic checks typical of capitalism is causing what Smith has called an ecological apocalypse. Environmentalists who advocate a simpler no-growth economy are 100% correct. <laughs> 
But unless they also recognize that this is impossible within capitalism, there are another variety of climate change deniers. Finally, the mode of production analysis also gives us the key conditions for socialism. As Marx conceived it, this is a society where the means of production are under collective but democratic control. So the conditions for exploitation do not exist. The producers control the product of their labor and they get it all back collectively. This is expressed in the famous quote from Capital Volume 3, quote, the producers rationally regulate their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control with the least expenditure of energy and un under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature, unquote. Beyond that, he says, is the true realm of freedom, concluding the shortening of the workday is its basic prerequisite, unquote. Today, it's ever more clear that in Rosa Luxemburg's words, humanity's choice is between socialism and barbarism. Thank you. No, I, I agree with, with uh, Nancy on that. I mean, I think uh, uh, a better way to start to think about is a decommodification. Um, I, you know, I had the good fortune to go all the way through to my PhD without, you know, without spending a penny. I mean, I was totally supported. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when you say that to people today, they think, what kind of crazy country were you in? But in, in Britain in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, you, you know, I got all the way through to my PhD and it was, it was free. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we should decommodify education, we should decommodify healthcare, we should start to decommodify even basic food uh, supplies, we should decommodify uh, basic uh, housing, uh, transport, things of that kind. And in other words, uh, a strategy of decommodification seems to me to be uh, very important. And then. And then some of these other things about uh, worker control and so on will make much more sense in a context in which there's this uh, other process uh, going on. So I think that, uh, and, and when Marx talks uh, in Capital about the associated labels getting together and uh, deciding in control of their own means of production and freely deciding what it is they're going to produce and how they're going to produce it, Clearly, associated laborers need to talk to other associated laborers, so there have to be uh, communicative structures. And of course, given present technologies, it's possible now to develop uh, solidarity economies of that kind, which stretch across uh, different production systems. So, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of potentiality that exists already in the world to do that. But no, there's uh, one of the problems of, of this is that people often look for one single bullet. You've got to do this is the answer when really actually you start to have to think about uh, readjusting all sorts of uh, uh, aspects. And foundationally for me, the transformation to socialism is at the end of the day a transformation of social relations. And if the social relations don't change, no matter what the technologies are, what the you know, institutional arrangements are, then you're screwed. You're back in capitalism.